How's it going, guys? What a great time to be alive. Wouldn't you agree? And you know what I've been doing? I've been watching She-Ra and the Princesses of Power on Netflix. And right now, that's pretty much my favorite show. It's one of my favorite shows. I love He-Man. I love She-Ra. I love uh, these old television shows from Mattel. And I think that they really are something that's good in the world. I think that He-Man and She-Ra, She-Ra and He-Man, are something that really are good in the world. And I've really been enjoying the entire series of She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. Now, what I want to remark on is how much better this, uh, this, this most recent season is. Right now, I'm watching season five. And I have to say, they really increased the level of detail. You know, some people, you know, they do the best at the first, and then they'll, at, uh, at the end, they're less and less good. But She-Ra is getting better with time. It's getting better over time. And not just the story. The story is getting better, but... Okay, that's wrong. The story's not getting better. The story is just continuing to be really good. I don't think that the story is less good or more good. I think that the story is really good. Both in the f first season, second season, third, fourth, and the fifth season. But uh, I do think that something has happened that in the story that makes it even, that, that really increases my happiness. What I really enjoyed was watching uh, Adora go through character development really fast. And by the way, I think that they really improved the attention to visual detail as well. You know, they they really went all out with this new uh, this new ser the new ep the new season of the series. They just increased the attention to, de to detail when it comes to the way it looks and how it and, and all the visual effects and the the drawing. And the, the character details and just the, the interactions of the characters but they also really paid a lot of attention to tying together and answering the questions the tying together the story answering the questions that we've been asking ourselves the whole the whole series and you know providing you know deep spiritual significance to everything and you know highlighting and painting the picture creating the story of heroism, you know, forcing uh, Adora to go through character development. And when I say that, I'm saying that she's going through a monumental amount of character development. I'm not saying that she has not been doing character development the whole series, because that would be wrong. In fact, if you have to say who has done the most character development from beginning to end of the whole series, it is Adora. She is the main character, and she really has developed. You can tell how much she's changed from episode to episode. Every single episode, in every single uh, season, you get more and more character development. You can notice it. You can see the difference. And it really is an amazing story of growth as a person. And what's remarkable, and what I think testifies to the image of God in humanity is that, you know, we can grow as a person, but your personality stays the same. Who you are stays the same. What, the way, the way you are, your personality, what you're like, your quirks, you know, the quirks, the quirks that make you who you are, they don't change. You know, your temperament doesn't change, but you get more depth. And when you become more deep, that doesn't take away the stuff, what you had before, it just means you're more deep. It means you have more, not less. And it just shows that the, the process of human growth is not a process of trading one thing for another thing so that you lose stuff over time. You're not trading up. You're not trading one thing for another. The process of the growth of a human being is additive. It's, ad it, it, it's addition. It's not exchanging. It's not subtraction. It's addition. It's growth. Anyways, I thought I thought this uh, fifth season is really, really good. And I thought that the entire series is really good from beginning to end. 
when I compliment the fifth season, I'm not in any way whatsoever comparing it to the first, second, and third, and fourth season and saying that those are less good. I think that they're all equally good. And that's not and, and that's not me being trite. That's not me giving you a simple, cheap, uh, cheap answer. That's that's my genuine opinion. But I just really enjoyed. I really enjoyed what happened and the way they did it, and I just really enjoyed the attention to detail. You know, it was already really good, and then they added something more. They added more, you know, attention to human activity. What do human beings do? You know, I think about the way, and spoiler alert, this is spoiler alert, okay? I think about the way that they're walking through the camp, you know, they're hiding from Board Prime. And uh, uh, Seahawk is sitting there uh, polishing his sword, and Adora's walking past, and he just waves hello. You know, he just waves hello to her, and she waves hello to him, and they're walking past, and that's just a simple human interaction. It's just an attention to detail of what, this is what people do. When you walk past them, you say hello. You know, because, and I don't think this is a, a quality thing. I think that this is, maybe it is, but I think it's a change in focus. I think that the focus has changed between season four and season five. I think that we've changed focus from the events that are happening around us to the people who are happening inside these events. So now it's not as much about the events that are taking place as it is the people and how they're handling it and their human, their little human interactions that they have day to day. You know, also, what all, I also noticed the, the increase, and I said this before, but the small details, the small visual details of the animation that just weren't there before. But I think that a lot of people are missing the point about She-Ra. And I want to draw your attention to this television show, and, and I hope you watch it because it's really good. And if, if you're not, you know, into cartoons, if you're not into animation, well, maybe maybe this would be a good place to start. Um, but you know, I, I'm hoping that if you have never watched it, that you'll at least give it a try, and that if you have watched it, that you'll look at it with a new perspective. I think that people are really missing the point about Shira because Shira is not about identity politics, and that's not even just about politics. But I mean, it's not about identity. It's not about identity issues. I don't think, even though Shira does have a lot of representation from a lot of different uh, identities, I don't think that Shira is about that. I think that when we get distracted about looking at ourselves, we don't have the ability to look at other people. So when we look at Shira and all we can see is ourself, then you're not really appreciating the television show. So different people have many different identities. And, you know, some can, somebody can identify one way or they can identify another way. And it's pro and you probably will be represented in that show because there's so many different identities represented. So that's great, but that's not what the show is about. That's just something that happens to be part of the show, but it's not the main focus of the show. And I think that's a lesson for life too. We can have parts and pieces of ourselves that is part of our identity, but that's, you know, one part of our identity is not the whole thing. You are so much more than the, than the sum of your parts. You can have different parts of you, different aspects about you, but one single aspect of you is, is not, you know, the entire, the entire summation of who you are. And so, I think that we need to realize that there's so much more to life than the stuff that we focus on. We can focus on something, but there's so much more to life than the stuff that we that we focus on. 
anyways, I think that the real the real meaning of Shira is really what it presents itself to be. It's about friendship. It's about human relationships. It's about people loving each other. And I'm not talking about sex. I'm not talking about romance. The show is not a romantic show. The whole show is not about romance. It's not about sexuality. It's not about gender identity or whatever. In fact, I would say that the show really goes out of its way to avoid that. You know, you do not see Shira or Bo or Dora or Glimmer or really anyone else in the entire television series um, get involved in romance very much or in uh, flirtation very much or in very much sexuality whatsoever. I think that they're really, um, they're, they really put that aside. They don't focus on it. You know, they focus on life. They focus on living life. And I think that's a very positive message. Life is not about sex. Life is not about romance. You know, that's a really good part of life. It's something that's really good and it's really wonderful. It's a blessing from God. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. It's a blessing. But it's not, life is not about that. You know, Odora is more focused on living life and being herself and being who she is and figuring everything out and trying to be a good person and a hero and a good friend and to follow her spiritual journey. She, you know, this is a very spiritual show. And I think it's a godly spirituality. As a Christian, I'm looking at it at She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, the, the modern one on Netflix, and I think it's an extremely righteous, godly, good television show. And I may not agree with every single thing that is represented, but that doesn't mean that I hate it. I do not. I love the show, and I love the characters in the show, okay? So when you say that if you don't agree with if you don't agree with yourself if, you don't, if, if somebody does not agree with you they must hate you or fear you or, or they must be a monster well that's not true I think that's the opposite of representation that's the opposite of inclusion that's the opposite of the open society that Bright Moon and the Rebellion and the Resistance represent because they're about the idea that you could be different. You can have a different personality, you can have a different opinion, you can have a different viewpoint, you can even have different morals, and you can still live together and love each other as people. I think Shadow Weaver is, is an example of that. She was evil, but she found, you know, redemption in, you know, it's... I'll, I'll mention this more later, but, you know, she... Her real motivation is that she loves her students. The real thing that motivates Shadow Weaver, even though she is an evil character, a genuine evil character, she really just cares about the people that she takes on as children, as surrogate adopted children or uh, students. And that's really what motivates her, is that love or the rejection of that love. And, uh, you know, but the problem is, the thing, what I'm trying to point at is that you can have different morals, and you can disagree with people, and you can still love them and be their friend and care about them. I would say that Shadow Weaver is a good friend to her students. I don't think that she really opens up to many people, but to people that she takes on as a mentor, she really does open up and become their friend. And what I'm saying is, I can disagree with you on something. I can disagree with you about some aspect of uh, gender identity or the morals and spirituality about that. But that doesn't mean that does not mean that I that there's hatred or you know bad feelings there. That's just a moral conviction. And different people have different moral convictions. So, 
that's part of representation. That's part of uh, inclusivity, and that's part of having an open society, a free society. You know, that's based on love. That's based on acceptance. That's based on you know compassion and caring about caring about other people. Okay. And so, I, I, back to what I was saying, I, I think that the show is not about identity. It's not about identity issues. It's not about gender identity. It's not about sexuality. It's not about any of those things. And once again, you might say, you might try to say, I would not, I would say you're wrong, but you might try to say, well, it's about, um, rela you know, romantic relationships, but it's, it's really not. It's not about romantic relationships. It's not about re really any. There's, there, there's no, there's no primary characters who have a romantic relationship that drives the story. It's part, it is considered to be part of who they are. It's part of not their identity, it's part of their personality. I think that your identity is different from your personality, your soul. I think your quintessence, let's call it quintessence. I think that really is the best word for it. Your quintessence, your soul, your personality, the who you are, your who you are, your personality, or your quintessence, really is, really is you. Your identity is something that is on the outer layer of that. You know, you might have one gender identity, or you might have a different gender identity, but you would still have the same personality. If you're a quirky, fun person, you're going to be the same way whether you're straight or anything else. And if you are like Adora, and you're a really dorky, tough, strong, go-getter, you know, high-strung personality, that's the way you are. That's who you are. That's that's your that's your essence. That's your quintessence. That's your soul. That's who you are. That's your personality. That's not going to change if your uh, your preferences of who you want to date change. You know, you can change who you prefer to date, but that's not going to change your personality. Wow. And I think that that's an important thing to think about. So please keep that in mind when I say. I think that She-Ra is, and the Princesses of Power is really about um, re human relationships and friendships. You know, it's really about friendships and relationships. It's about, you know, big issues of good and evil. Like, genuine spiritual good and genuine spiritual evil. And it's about fighting tyranny. And it's about friendship and love and relationship in a non-romantic way. It's about human relationships and loving other people as friends and as brothers and as sisters and as neighbors and as fellow members of your society, but mostly as friends and as people. I think that Shira is about relationships between people and about more and equally, and it's not just about that. It's about, I would say, as much or even more, even more than that. It's about big issues of good versus evil and fighting tyranny, fighting against oppression, fighting against tyranny. And when I'm talking tyranny and oppression, I'm not talking about the ridiculous and untrue idea of microaggressions. Well, the you know, you sub somehow subconsciously, you know, moved your foot in the in the way with the way that you were talking to me, you had a a stance a physical orientation of your feet and you pointed your feet towards me or away from me so that indicates you were not interested so that's a microaggression because you're racist or something like the whole idea of microaggressions is really ridiculous and and it's also very hateful to accuse people of stuff that they're not actually doing on purpose think about entrapta entrapta is not evil Entrapta is not committing microaggressions. She's autistic. And the creators of the story have openly said that. And it's... it's uh, Being autistic myself, I can tell. 
you know, I can see that. That's that's my story. I am. That's me. I am autistic. I have. I am on the spectrum of of autism. And uh, not as much as Entrapta. Not to the same uh, amount, but I am. And, uh, but she is not committing microaggressions because of, you know, some hidden unseen hatred. That's a lie. There's no such thing as hidden unseen hatred. If you hate someone, you hate someone. And if you love them, you love them. It's not... Think about Katra. Katra is someone who loves and hates. And she hates because she loves. Hatred is not the opposite of love. Hatred is what happens when you feel that your love has been rejected. If, you, if you're really mad at someone, it's usually because you loved them, you do love them, and now you're mad at them, and that can create hate. If you don't care, you're not going to hate someone. You're not going to hate someone that you don't care what they do. If you don't care what they do, then you're not going to hate them because they did something that bothered you. You know, there's something that's annoying, maybe, but there's not something that you hate. You have to love someone and something in order to hate. But, so when we, when we see a hateful character, someone who truly has hatred, you might probably say that is Katra. Katra does have some hatred, some genuine hatred. You know, most of the soldiers of the Horde do not have hatred. Adora does not have hatred. Hordak, Hordak, who is for most of the series the big villain, he is not based on hatred. Maybe arrogance, maybe, maybe a little bit of you know, male you know, malice and spite, but he's not hateful. He doesn't hate people. He might, you know, have high standards and, you know, a low opinion of people who are incompetent, in his opinion. But uh, he doesn't hate anybody because he doesn't care. You see, Hordak doesn't care. But Katra does hate. She hates Adora at different times and then stops hating Adora. She has a different... She, sorry, not different. She has a difficult struggle between friendship and a broken heart and hatred. But you see, what I'm trying to say is there's no microaggression. Microaggression is not true. Entrapta is an example of how just because someone is doing something doesn't mean that they hate you. It might be annoying you. Maybe you don't understand what they're doing. But you are really being superstitious. It's superstitious to try to claim that you understand the motivations of what people do or that you even understand. You don't understand what people are doing. If somebody is doing what you think is a microaggression, you're, for, you're assuming that you know what they're doing. But you don't know that. And you don't know why. And maybe they don't have any reason. It, or maybe it's, they're doing it for no reason at all. They're just doing it because they're doing it because maybe that's what their body tells them to do. Or, you know, it's just physical comfort. People cross their arms mostly for physical comfort. It's not a sign of confrontation. When we do that in the middle of confrontation, it's because they're looking for comfort. They're giving themselves a hug. And the reason they do it in the middle of the fight is because they feel really uncomfortable fighting. So they're looking for comfort, so they hug themselves. That's what that's why people cross their arms. If you didn't know that. So anyways, the the main issue of the story is about fighting oppression and tyranny. And when I'm talking tyranny, I'm talking about, like, the USSR type of tyranny. And that's really what the Horde is. The Horde is not fascism. The Horde... So you might say that the first ones might, might have been. But the Horde is more like communism. The Horde is communism. It's communism, it's socialism, it's collectivism right down to the core. And this becomes very apparent in the last season because we finally meet Horde Prime and his creepy, creepy collectivist hive mind. And that's exactly what communism is and socialism. Socialism is the philosophy of communism. The end goal of socialism is communism. If you're a socialist, that means that you are someone who wants communism. And if you think that you're not wanting communism, 
then I think you are fudging with the numbers in your in you're fudging with the calculations, and you're not thinking in a sober way. In a you know you, we have to be sober minded. If we are so thrilled with an idea that we do not consider the consequences, then we're not thinking straight. Yeah, it's really fun to drive your car fast, but it's also not safe. And you could crash yourself or someone else really bad. There is no difference between socialism and communism. And that's a fact. Anyways, the main idea of, of the show is standing up for heroism. You know, deep moral heroism. Spiritual heroism. The idea of being a hero... That's a spiritual thing. There's no such thing as a hero unless there is spirituality in the universe. If there is no spirituality, if, if we are the only thing that exists in the universe, if there's nothing magical out there, then there's no such thing as being a hero because there's no such thing as morals. If there's no ultimate morals, some, you know, some spiritual standard that exists in the universe then there's no way that you can meet that standard and be a hero. If there's no magic, if there's no spirituality, then there's no hero's journey and there's no... I don't think you need the hero's journey to have heroism or understand it. I think that the hero's journey is very interesting, but I think it is overblown. I think it is overblown and we give it too much credit. We give it too much uh, authority. I think it's not really... The, 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 the end-all, do-all of the universe. Or of fiction. I think it's a very, very cool. It's very useful. It can be a good thing. But I do not believe it is, as you say, the truth. Like the ultimate underlying truth of the universe. It's not. Or of heroism. It's not even the underlying truth of heroism. Heroism exists apart from and independent from the hero's journey being or not being there. Um, but it's about spiritual heroism and moral heroism, personal heroism, emotional heroism. It's about friendships. It's about love. It's about loving other people. We get so caught up. In America, we are, I would say we are oversexed. And that's not to be offensive, but we focus too much on romance and sex. And, you know, life is not about romance and sex. You know, it's very important, and it's a good thing, it's, and it's a blessing, and it's wonderful. But you can live your whole life and never have sex, and never have romance, and you can be happy in yourself. And if you're not able to live without romance and sex, then I would say that's a genuine health problem. I, not not like physical health problem, but like that's a damage on you. If you're not able to, for example, live without something, then what does that say of your existence? If you need something, then if, if you can't be happy unless you're in a relationship, then you're not really happy. Because if that relationship goes away, then then so do you, basically. If everything is based on, and this is what we see with Catra. Catra is this way. Catra needs Adora. The reason why Catra is basically having an emotional collapse, she's basically having a breakdown the entire series from season one to season five, is because Adora left her. And, the, and, and Adora did not betray her. Catra thinks that Dora that Adora betrayed her. Horde Prime reads, sorry, spoilers, Horde Prime reads the thoughts of Catra and takes over her mind and so he can read all her thoughts and her memories. And so all he has is Catra's perspective. He does not have Adora's perspective. And since he is evil and I would say foolish, he does not have an independent perspective of what is right and wrong good or evil, good or bad, or heroic, or or about justice and the way things should work in the universe. He does not have that clear 
good informed perspective. So when he reads Catra's thoughts and then he's trying to fight Adora with words, he says, you betrayed Catra. You broke her heart. So first of all, he only has the perspective of Catra. He does not have anyone else's perspective. Except maybe his own, which is not really very much involved. He does he's not involved. He's not there. He's an outsider. And not a and he, but he doesn't also have he also does not have a clear, independent, informed sense of what is right and wrong and good, so he can't judge morals. So maybe he does think that Adora abandoned or betrayed Katra. But he's wrong. Adora did not. Adora didn't do anything wrong. She never did. Adora, Adora is supposed to follow Catra around forever and ever and go wherever Catra goes and do whatever Catra does, but Catra is not obligated to do the same thing? Question mark? How come when Catra goes somewhere, Adora is supposed to follow, but when Adora goes somewhere, Catra doesn't have to follow? If Catra were really consistent and loving, then she would have followed Adora out of friendship and love and would not have been afraid. Because love casts out fear. If you have love, then you're not afraid. Love drives fear out. So, anyways, Catra is obsessed with Adora. She needs Adora. Without Adora, Catra cannot be happy. And that is not healthy. And it's not true to yourself. If you're true to yourself, I would go down and say, this is really about human existence. I am that I am. God has created you to exist. You are, insert your name here. You might be, let's say your name is Emily. If your name is Emily, then you are Emily. You are and you, you have existence. You have the characteristic or the trait of you exist because you have the image of God. God said to Moses, he explained his name. Moses said, who are you? And God said, I am that I am. And you could also interpret the Hebrew to say, I am who I am. My preferred interpretation is I am that I am, but I think they're both true. I think that God is saying both. When God is speaking Hebrew, God is choosing to speak Hebrew. Therefore, God is choosing to take upon himself the connotations and denotations that Hebrew allows him to make. God is making a dual statement, but they're both true. So, but the thing is, you have the right to say, I am. I am George. I am Fred. I am Emily. And Emily is a name of a character in the show, by the way. Um, I am Entrapta. I am Bo. I am Adora. I, you can say, and I'm, I'm using these characters as examples, but you could say, you could say this about you can, you, anyone can say this. It goes down to the issue of your soul, your personality, your quintessence, the who you are of you, the part of you that is the who you are. Of It, it is you, you yourself. Far more deep, far more important, far more central than even your identity that you give yourself. You are you. You are you. You are you. You are yourself. You are who you are. You exist. You are alive. You are a person. And you have a personality and a soul and an essence and a quintessence. And basically, if you depend yourself on sex or love or romance or a relationship, you're not really happy, and that's not really true. It's not true. It's fake. It's a scam. It's really a scam. It's not true. And it's it's an attack. It's a it's a 
destructive injury, it's like a hull breach. If you're a spaceship and you have a hull breach, that's damage. If you're a boat and you're leaking, that's damage. If you're an airplane and the wings have got holes in them that, or you're losing engines, that's damage. And that's the same thing with needing something that you have to have it. You exist. And when God says, I am that I am, I am that I am, well, he made you in his image. So you have, that, you have the right to say that, not as claiming that you are God, but that you exist so that you exist. You exist for your own sake. God did not make you to exist for a purpose that is other than you. God did not create you to be, to exist for a purpose to do some job in the universe. God created you because he wanted to create you. God doesn't need your help to accomplish some task in the universe. God does not need your help to accomplish fate. God made you because he likes you. He made you because he loves you, because he wanted you to exist. God wants you to exist. And he gives you his nature, his image. He gives you that. And he says, I am that I am, because he wants you to say, and he enable, He gives you permission to say, I am that I am. And he's not saying it just because he's giving you permission to say it. It's because it's true. It's because it is reality. You are that you are, because God made you. The eternal, self-existing God made you on purpose just because he liked who you are and so do i so do i but anyways yeah this show is not about love in a romantic sense we get so caught up on that we're focused we're too focused on love romance and sex it's not about that it's about human relationship love between two people that is friendship it's a relationship. Bo and Adora are not dating. Bo and Glimmer, as far as I'm aware, are not dating. You know, most of the characters in the show, they have human relationships. It's not about having a romantic relationship. A deeper and better relationship between two humans that you could call friendship, and they, they are friends. Relationships can be friendships. And relationships can be human. And relationships can be romantic, but it's not always about that. And it isn't, and it isn't always. In fact, the only people who are overtly romantic for most of the series, I'm not going to spoil everything, um, is really the people who are overtly married, like uh, King, uh, Queen Angela and King Micah, or... Uh, Spinarella and Natasa, I think. I forget their names. But, uh... And I'm, I'm going on a limb to say this here. Thanks for listening this long, by the way. Um, Adora and Bo and Glimmer and Entrapta and Catra and Perfuma and literally everyone else in the series, except for those who are openly stated as dating... For, the, for for ninety percent of the series, they don't act on that. Even if they feel feelings, it's not driving them. It's not motivating them. They're not acting on it. You don't see it. It's not visible. It's either not visible or it's not there. Either it is invisible, or it is not there. You know. And here's the thing: love can be spontaneous, and I'm not gonna. I, I'm spoiling the show, but you, you knew from the beginning, so you chose to listen this far. Um, I'm not going to spoil it even now, but I'm going to give you a general idea. Love can be spontaneous. Just because you fall in, in love with someone you know, at a, you know, at a late stage in the story does not mean that you loved, you were in love with them for your whole life. Okay? So... If you fall in love with someone at a late stage, that does not mean that you were in love with them months ago or years ago. 
Love can happen just like that. I don't know if you can hear my finger snapping. Love can happen just like that. In the twinkling of an eye, in the snap of a finger, you can have love at first sight. And I have. That's my personal testimony. I have. And that is a spiritual thing that is eternal and immaterial and transcendent and immutable and powerful and amazing and righteous and good. And, you know, everything that is spiritual can have and does have a, spirit, a physical counterpart. Everything that is spiritual comes out in the physical realm. Everything. Everything that is spiritual always does and or always can come out in the physical realm. If you have deep, bitter sadness, that is tr a truly spiritual thing. Emotions are an eternal, immaterial, non-physical, spiritual thing that is part of you as an eternal spirit, an eternal soul, and an ephemeral and ethereal heart. Let's talk about ethereal, something that is ethereal, something that is ephemeral. Let's say ethereal, and that's the name of the planet, Etheria. Well, it is that which is not physical, but it exists. Something ethereal is not physical, but it does exist. And not even as quarks and protons and muons and gluons and, you know, things like that. No, 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 no. I'm talking about metaphysical here. Something that metaphysically exists. Something that s exists spiritually. Something that spiritually exists. And if you're an atheist, maybe you're going to have a stumbling block. You're going to have a hard time getting this. But you do not write the dictionary of how the universe works. You do not get to you know, reject and ignore and override everyone else's personal testimony. You are idiosyncratic, but you are projecting yourself onto everyone else, and that's not honest. Um, but I'm just going to go out and say it. There is such a thing as the ethereal. That which is ethereal, like emotions, really do exist. You are... I am that I am. My emotions are that they are, and they are what they are. They exist, and your emotions exist. And when you have sadness, sadness does have a physical, a physical uh, manifestation. And what I'm trying to say is that the physical is just as good as the spiritual, but the spiritual is most important. And the physical should be in charge of the physical. The spirit should lead the body. The spirit should lead the heart. The heart should lead the soul. The soul should lead the mind. And the mind should lead the body. So the spirit should lead the body. You know, that's why we say mind over body, because that's true. You can have intellectual knowledge that you are mistaken. But because you don't want to admit that you are wrong in your heart or because you do not like the ideas you have like a child you could say a childish or a dishonest re rebellion against the ideas that are being presented to you you can know that you are intellectually wrong but use the strength of your heart to arm wrestle your mind and win and real and to override your mind, so you're acting irrationally because you're acting from the heart. Because you don't want to believe, you don't want to believe it. And so, and I think that's what this show is about. The purpose of this show is to demonstrate that there is such a thing as magic. There is such a thing as the spiritual. There is spirituality. There is, there is such a thing as the spirit magic, the, the spiritual, the eternal, the soul, destiny, fate, the afterlife. These things are very real. And we live in America, in the West, and we've just had all of this wealth and this beauty and this magic and this goodness just stolen from us by arrogant, foolish, and selfish people. 
selfish, 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 selfish people. So it's hard for us, even for me as a Christian, but I grew up in the West. I grew up in America. That's part of the West. It's hard for me to th to to think about my own spirituality or spirituality as an idea without the specter of metaphysical naturalism. It's metaphysical naturalism. It's the, you know, the the concept that there is nothing spiritual, which itself is a spiritual statement. You're making a religious statement about not having any religion, so that doesn't make any sense. But the, basically, that's that's why Etheria and Eternia really do represent something righteous and godly and good. And I'm not saying that these shows show, tell the gospel. I'm not certain that they do. I don't think they do. Maybe they do, but I don't think so. And I think that there's a difference, a significant difference between shows. So here's my plug, my shameless plug for Christianity here. I think if you're a Christian, you should watch this show. This is a great show. But just be aware that there may not be the gospel in it and that this is not the end-all, do-all. And you may have to be careful. There may be something in here that you have to be careful of that could lead you and the entire Christian community astray if you, you know, use it wrong or if you don't pay attention to that with carefulness. You know, doctors can use, you know, poison as a medicine because they are careful with it and they know what to do. But people should not medicate themselves because you don't know what you're doing. And so if you have the protection and the guidance of the Holy Spirit and his word and his truth of Christ and the Father, then you will be safe when you go into anything. But here's something else I want to say. I say that there are some stories that are godly and good, no matter their content, and some stories are evil and satanic and, you know, deathly. They're deathly, regardless of their content. You can have a, a wonderfully, you know, innocent-seeming child television show that is deathly, that is of, of Satan, that is not godly. And you can have a very rough show, a very, very brutal and rough show that is very, that is of God. And it is acceptable and it is good to watch. But it's going to be very hard for you to watch it. But you, you, it is of God, even though it's very rough. And I think that Shira is the best of both worlds. It is both godly and innocent, for the most part, aside from, you know, peril and danger and fighting. and. But, you know, that's not bad. It's not bad to have peril. God has peril in the Bible. God has fighting in the Bible. You know, and people are suffering, and there is suffering. And I'm not saying that's good. But I'm saying that I say the worst thing in the very worst thing that is in Shira and the princesses of power is when people are suffering. You know, people get tortured to some extent. People get hurt. People get injured. People suffer. That's the worst part. I would say that fighting good, good guys fighting bad guys is not bad. Good guys fighting other people, even if you know, for whatever reason, is not bad. I would say that combat is not immoral. Combat is not immoral. The only thing that is immoral is combat that is for for because you ha you are being immoral. You know, attacking someone wrongly is immoral, but fighting someone in defense or in the service of what is good is not immoral. And by the way, Antifa is evil. Antifa is evil. You suck. You need to just quit. And you're lame. And we're all laughing at you. <clears throat> so if you don't want people to laugh at you, you should give up and quit. And the American people are stronger than you. So you're not going to get away with this for much longer. But, um, 
I would say that watching a television show that has combat is not immoral. I would say that being a warrior and a hero is an essential part of being human. And here's something else. I think that this show is about humanity. It's about being human. Even if not everyone in the show is human. I would say that they have the image of God. They are human in their soul, even if they're not physically human. But, because they're a person. <clears throat> but, you know, this show, I would say, is of God, and it is innocent and righteous. So it is the best of both worlds. It is both of God, and it is upstanding and moral and innocent. And I don't, I, n I don't think that there's anything against it except two things that you could say. Number one, from a biblical perspective, the gender identity issues. But that doesn't mean that the show is bad. It merely means that these people exist in the show. And the show does not... You know, the, the, the show is... The show is it's not pushing it. It's not pushing anything on you. It's just having these people exist. And that's not bad. It's not pushing... It's not pushing that. But it is... You could say that it is making it normal. It is portraying it as normal. And I do not think it is normal, so I disagree with that. But you could look at the show and say... Because it's not really pushing the idea that it's normal either. You could say that it's portrayed that way, but that idea of normalcy is not being pushed. It's not being spread. In fact, what I'd say is that this show doesn't really get involved. I said this before, and I'll, I said this before earlier in the show, so I'll say it again now. This show really goes out of its way to avoid dealing with romance or sexuality or even gender identity at all. It just acknowledges that certain people exist and that they are central characters in the story and they are the way they are. And that's not saying anything about goodness or badness or whatever or correct or, tr or incorrect or true or false or healthy or unhealthy or m made by God that way or not made by God that way or it's the way it should be or it's the way it shouldn't be. It doesn't say anything. It just lets everybody be the, you know, come as you are, and it doesn't matter, and we're not, we're not judging each other. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't judge, but I'm saying that they're not worrying about it. And I think that we should work to lead, to, to, to inspire people to want to have normative, healthy, heterosexual identity, I guess, to, to be the way that God made you to be, or to be asexual, that is an option. You can be a eunuch if you want, if that's what God made you to be. That is an option. But if you meet someone who happens to be different, are you going to be nice to them? I hope so. You should be. And so... Gosh, I really hate I really hate the idea of that you have to have condemnation. Because it's really I think that the way that they live is very righteous. I love the way that they all live together in harmony and friendship, and it's not about that. You know, I think we focus too much on making this our identity and being so loud about it. You know, you know, I think that, you know, gay pride is a very bad thing because it makes it the most important thing and everyone has to look at you and that is the... Everyone has to make a decision. You're forcing people to make a decision. You know, it's like someone who's political, like me, for example. You go up to someone and your leading, your leading statement, the very first statement you make to them is, I like this or that politics. Okay, well, now people can't have a relationship with you based on your personality and your soul and your who, your essence and your quintessence of who you are, your personality who, of you being yourself. Now you've defined yourself, you've intellectually defined yourself this way, and you really just 
start it, you just project it. It's a pro you're projecting this loud, you know, blow horn of this is, you know, this is what I'm all about. So now everyone has to make a decision and it really divides people. In She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, you have various people of various gender identities and sexualities. And we just don't worry about it. We focus on getting along and living together and not worrying about each other's differences. And the main aspect of that is that the individual characters do not act like vegans pushing their veganism on everyone else or like gay pride pushing their pride of themselves on everyone else. Pride is rude. You know, maybe some of them are straight, some of them are various other th other ways. And you know what? They just don't deal with it. They just don't worry about it. They just focus on being together as a community and loving each other and working together as friends. And it's not about no one is dating anyone. They yeah, they had a dance and somebody asked somebody to the dance because that's what you're supposed to do. That doesn't mean that they're dating or having sex or romantically or sexually attracted to each other at all. It just means that they wanted to go to the dance. You know? So this show really doesn't deal with that. It doesn't talk about it and it's not it's not that it doesn't exist. It is in there. There is some romantic, you know, some attraction, some some of that sort of getting, you know, getting butterflies in your stomach sort of stuff. That is there, but it's not a it's not the most important. It's not even a major thing. And because it's not the center of life. It's not the most important thing of life. <clears throat> and it really does the reason why Eternia the planet Eternia and the planet Etheria are so important is because they show that there is eternity. There is the eternal. And Etheria, there is the ethereal. And this is a rock-solid truth, that there is the ethereal. And that is possibly almost more important than the idea of eternity. I would rather live in a, temp in a, short, in a short-lived universe that has ethereal truth than live in an eternal universe that does not have any Etheria. I would choose Etheria over Eternia because Etheria has joy. But I would not sacrifice Eternia because without Eternia that's just sad. So you need joy and happiness. Joy and happiness are not the same thing. Joy is deep in your heart and it's based and it's connected to hope and love and and deep inner spiritual ethereal non-physical truth such as love and hope and joy and faith and a deep spiritual journey and destiny like Shira Adora she loses the ability to be Shira and she questions whether or not she has a spirituality anymore if she lost it she lost herself she lost part of herself. She lost her destiny. She lost her fate. She lost her spiritual journey. But then we realize that she never actually lost it at all because it's, it's not possible to lose who you are. And being Shira is not something that you lose. I doubt that she even really lost the sword either. But you know, so I, I would say that if you have to pick one, you should pick Etheria, but you can't, you must not, you cannot lose Eternia. And luckily, in our universe, we have both. Praise God. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. And yeah, it's really about, and I mentioned oppression, it's about real, like, physical, existential oppression from a conquering totalitarian government, an evil force, or an angry mob an angry horde, an evil horde, like Antifa. Antifa is the real face of oppression in America. If you're looking at people, you know, you know, you don't see white men, capitalist white men, burning down, you know, African-American barbershops. But I see Antifa doing that. You don't see, you know, you don't see... I would say that Antifa is the real villain here. 
and their communist mindset, and which is also fascist. They're, I would say that they are a mixture of both fascism and communism at the same time. They use the physical strategies of fascism in order to achieve the intellectual goals of communism. So I believe that they are intellectual communists, but physical fascists. And I believe that they have an intellectual fusion of fascism and communism when it comes to what they care about and who they hate. Because communists are worried about hating the rich people, but com fascists are worried about being racist. But Antifa are both racist and involved in class warfare. So they, 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 are, they hate people based on money, and they also hate people based on race. So they are both fascist and communist. So we should not call them Antifa. We should call them Arifa because they are fascist. And somehow we should work the, the communist angle into their name too because they are fascist and they are communist. But um, we were talking about an angry, the evil horde, you know, an evil mob or an evil group of people that's, that's focused on, you know, domination and taking power. Or we're talking about, you know, an evil government or a conquering warlord such as Horde Prime or Hordak. That's what we're talking about. That's real oppression. Oppression is not having someone cross their arms in the middle of conversation and you felt offended because you're being superstitious. That's ridiculous. Oppression is someone trying to kick down your door and burn down your village. Such as happens in the show a lot. So, I think I've really said a lot. I think I've really gotten most of what I tried to say out. I think I really focused on... I really got across at the beginning of the video how much I like the show. How much I really appreciate... The, how fun it is. It's a really fun show. If you don't care about any of these deep issues, it is still an extremely fun, entertaining, well-written, comical, and beautifully uh, animated show. And it's lots of fun. And it's perfectly good. So if you're just looking for light-hearted entertainment, this is, your, this is a, a good place to go. But if you really pay attention... You have the option. You have an option. You could go and look at what's deeper that's underneath and, and driving the story. And that's really cool too. And to me, why is this show so important to me? Why would you make an hour hour long video about it? Because I believe that this show is representative of someone that I love. Someone that I knew someone who I knew that I love. And I think that Adora really represents her. And so, when I see Adora doing everything to a T, I see my friend. And this, and, and that, that Adora really represents and really is right down to the, to the nuts and bolts. Right down to the nuts and bolts and to the to the carpet on the deck. It really it really is my friend. And I love my friend. And I love Adora. So when I see that show, I just cannot help but be happy because I'm seeing a, a, a representation of my friend being happy and growing and flourishing. And I, I cannot I can I can't help but be happy when my friend when I see an image of my friend being happy and flourishing and having joy and growth and freedom. And I love that. And I love her. So that's why I care. But I also care because I love He-Man and She-Ra. And I believe that those television shows started as a, t as a toy line, but they is so much more than that. It really is an act of God that cannot be stopped by Satan, and it's already been done. So it's too late for Satan to even try to mess it up. It's an act of God, and it was really a blessing on, on the human race. You know, when we, when, we, when we think years and years down the line, I think that these stories are going to continue. 
because true and good stories do last. And I think that it's just such a good, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a godly thing. It's a very godly and righteous, holy thing. And I think that I'm not sure, but I think maybe it does have Jesus in there somewhere in the, in the way that Harry Potter does not. I would say, and I was trying to say this before, but I didn't say it. So I'll say it now. I do not think that Harry Potter is of God. And I do not think that Harry Potter is godly. And I do not think that it is uh, clean, at, as in it's not rough. It is, it is rough, it is not godly, and it is not of God. So three strikes are out, in my opinion. But in the exact opposite way, so that's like the counterpoint. Some, sh some stories are good in these three ways, or a mixture of those three ways, and some stories are not. And I would and I would hold these two stories in direct opposition. Anyways, I love Shira, and you know what? I would say that the intersectional left and all of their racism and gender warfare, race warfare, class warfare—they're interested in in having so many wars. If they they must be so hateful, because if they are so angry that they want to fight so many wars against so many people, they must be hateful. Because you have to be so hateful to want to start so many wars. Race warfare, class warfare, gender warfare, you know, political warfare, social warfare, physical warfare, in terms of Antifa. Um, you name it, every sort of intersectional or left-wing, you know, focus group that they want to fight over and divide everyone and have a battle. You know, that's wrong. And when, when you know, what's the most dangerous thing is the lies that they speak. They're trying to speak a lie against the white man, as they say. I don't speak about the white, I don't, I don't talk about people that way, but they do. They're angry at the white man, or they're angry at America. America is not afraid of a strong hero. There's no way you can do a better job of that than Adora. Adora and Adora Shira is the strong female hero who's well written and convincing. And I I really don't believe that there's a lack of convincing characters anyways, but Adora is above and beyond. So if if you if you're if you're claiming that you know all of the Americans loved Wonder Woman we love Wonder Woman from DC. That was a great movie. We loved her. We love Captain Marvel. And we love Adora. And the list continues and goes along. It's a long list. But if you really want to find fault, you're not going to succeed in finding fault with Adora, She-Ra, in this show. Unless you're just being irrational because you just want to find fault. So you're not being honest anymore. You know, if, if what you said about America or about the conservative right or about the white man or whatever, if that were true, then we would not love a heroine. We would not love a female hero who is different. But we do. So you're wrong. And we're not afraid of them. We're not afraid of you, and we don't dislike you. In fact, we love, we love those kinds of heroes. So, that's what I have to say. Uh, for the honor of Grayskull, and for Eternia, and for Etheria. Have a great day.